We're going to talk about honoring the wife as the weaker vessel, that your prayers be not hindered. Um, we're going to get back into this marriage series. I believe it's very important that we understand our duties as husbands and wives, what God expects from us. And, you know, you might say, well, I'm not married and I don't plan on being married, or maybe you're, you know, you were married or anything like that, but you know what? You can also help others with this. Okay, other people need to understand as you disciple, you're going to disciple people if you're doing things the way the Lord wants you to. You'll be discipling others that need some advice, that they need some biblical instruction on this. And it's, it's important that we understand from the scriptures what marriage is and our roles as husband and wife, what they are. Uh, a lot of mistakes have been made in marriages uh, we all make mistakes, we all fail, we all have to repent and get right with God, but sometimes these mistakes are fatal to the marriage. They don't have to be, though, okay? They don't have to be, but we make mistakes, and sometimes, you know what, you don't get a second chance. Now, a lot, of, many times God is merciful. Some of you can attest to that, and in, in God's mercy, he gave you another chance, all right? But sometimes that's not going to happen. It hasn't happened. There are some here that have went through that, the awful thing of divorce, and have, have had to deal with that. But I want you to understand what God expects. I think it's very important that husbands and wives understand that. If you are looking to get married someday, it's important for you to understand what to look for in a spouse. If, if you are a wife, that you understand what your role is. If you're a husband, you understand what your wife's role is. And that's really what we're going to talk about here is understanding how to dwell with the, the weaker vessel. What does that mean exactly? And why is that so despised today? To even say, if you talk about a weaker vessel to most, even in fundamentalist women, they, they don't like that. They don't like even hearing that. Why? Well, because they want to be strong. They don't want to be feminine. They don't want to be... There's too much of the world's feminist movement in the churches today. And these sermons are not fun to talk about because, for most people, because we have to deal with things that are hard to deal with. We have to deal with our own mistakes. That judgment must begin at the house of God. So if we can get our marriages right, then maybe we can just help others that are out there, that are stuck, or help others that... And maybe, you know what? Maybe right now you, you've, you know, you're in a situation to where you want to be married. Well, you know what? You'll be able to understand what God expects from you. If you're not willing to do that, then you're not willing to be married. Because this is what goes along with that. Some of you, it may open up some wounds of mistakes that you've made in the past. You can't change those. But you can move forward and do right. And that's, that, that's one of the biggest, that's one of the greatest things about being a child of God, that when we fail God, it hurts, we repent, but we can move forward and we can do right. We can not fix the past, but we can work on the future. All right, that's the, that's the thing that we have to take away from all of these. No matter what, in what walk of life you are, if you're a child and you're growing up, you know, these are still beneficial. They're, still, they're very beneficial for you to understand, for you to grow up and understand what God expects from marriage. You'd be surprised what these children pick up as they listen. You'd be surprised. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, I just pray you'd be with us now. Help us, Lord, as we examine this most important topic and understand as husbands to dwell with our wives according to knowledge, as the wife being the weaker vessel, that our prayers be not hindered. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First Peter chapter 3, verse number 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of God, uh, the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know, he, he goes into detail here. Uh, he first talks about even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So we talk, but likewise, what does that mean? He's likening that to what her role is. You are under as strict of rule as she is. And your rule is. This is your command is that you dwell with them according to knowledge. That you understand what you're dealing with. That's important. 
You know, uh, when we talked about leaving, cleaving, and reverencing, here's where the reverencing comes in. She's to reverence you, but now you are to deal with her according to knowledge. You are to dwell with her and to deal with her according to knowledge. That means that you have to understand what you're dealing with. It's very important that you do. So the first command that we look at is to dwell with them. It's Yes, wives are commanded to submit to their own husbands, but as husbands, we are commanded to submit to the Word of God. All must submit. The Bible says submit yourselves one to another, right? We are to submit in different areas and different things. But we all have to submit to the Word of God, which holds us accountable for our actions and how we as leaders conduct ourselves and handle all of our affairs. But a very important word sticks out here in the beginning of this great command for husbands. It says, likewise, in like manner, also, moreover, it's a, it is the meaning of the word. He just got done telling the wives to submit to their own husbands. So he's saying, husbands, knowing that a wife must submit to you, you must submit to this great truth under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. She has to submit to you, yes, calling you Lord and understanding that reverence that is to be had to her husband. But you must understand as she reverences you that you dwell with her according to knowledge. Understanding her as the weaker vessel. What does that mean exactly? I think there's a problem there because we have so many people that in marriage, they just kind of look at each other as equals in the sense of, well, she's just like a female man. That's really how they look at their wives is she's just kind of like you, only she's a woman. No, she's nothing like you. Really, seriously, nothing like you. And if, you're, if, you're, if your expectations are for her to be like you, you're in a lot of trouble. There are a lot of husbands that are not compassionate towards their wives, and they do not understand that she is not like you. She is not made like you. Now, some feminists will get upset with that. No, we're equal. No, you're not. You're not equal. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You're not equal. I'm here to tell you it's not a partnership, and you're not equal. Very plainly. It's not. Find me anywhere in the Bible where it says it's a partnership. You won't find it. Keep looking. You look a long time. It's not there. There's a head... And there's a body. There's a head that leads, and there's a body that follows. There's a head that is over things, that instructs things, that is in charge of things, and there is the lady that follows. But she is the weaker vessel and ought to be treated with that respect. No woman wants to submit to a tyrant or a bully. So God is telling the man that how he's to dwell with his wife. Dwell with them according to knowledge, he says. Give your wives by no species of unkind carriage any excuse for delinquency. How can a man expect his wife to be faithful to him if he be unfaithful to her? Do you understand that? If you are not dwelling with her according to knowledge, being faithful in the, in the, in the area which you are, how can you expect her to? How do you expect her to fulfill her role as a godly wife, submissive to her husband, when you are not fulfilling your role as honoring her and dwelling with her according to knowledge as the weaker vessel? It isn't going to happen. That's why we have so many problems today. Not understanding our roles. Not understanding what God expects. And, and for goodness sakes, nobody wants to preach the difference in the sexes any longer. You know why this preaching is so much more necessary? Because most people don't understand the difference between a man and a woman. And I'm not just talking about the anatomy. It's just that they're just literally, they don't understand the difference. And that, 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 that goes down into da uh, fathers raising daughters and raising sons. I've met more, more girls that were raised like men than I've ever seen, and that's in fundamentalist homes. They were just raised like men. They were raised with no distinction. None whatsoever. Yeah, you've got to be tough. You mean hard? Treating them like a boy? Yeah. Yeah, get out and go to work. 
Yeah, be a cop. See, that's not popular. It's, it's not popular to talk about these because we've evolved so much. We're so far past God's order now. I don't know what's wrong with you, you preachers preaching this old book here. It's 2016. What's the matter with you? Don't you know women do everything men do now? See, if, the, if that comment just bothered you because I'm mocking that, you might be a Jezebel. I got a little bit of that Jezebel spirit in you. You say, you're needling me. You bet I am. You bet I am. Absolutely I am. Unapologetically too. Because I hate that spirit and God hates it. And the only way to defeat it is to drive furiously through it. Give it no place. Give it no, no, don't allow it to question. Just go straight through it. Because it's wicked. It's destroying the differences in man and woman. It has absolutely destroyed them. And marriage is it. We don't understand the difference. And that's why husbands don't treat their wives as the weaker vessel any longer. They just don't. God informs us that we as men have no clue on our own how to dwell in love and unity with our wives. That we need the word of God. But the second great word I see here is to dwell with them. That word dwell is an easy word to understand. To abide as a permanent resident. I don't believe in long distance marriages. Not advisable. Husbands leaving for weeks at a time. A week at a time here and not dwelling with their wives and living with them permanently. How in the world can a husband be a husband if he's only home a few hours a week? Right, exactly. Traveling around the country without your wife. How in the world can a husband do that? Especially in this day and age. Doesn't sleep with his own wife in their bed. And love her and spend time with her and keep it with his duties as the head of the home in guiding and directing and loving her as Christ loved the church. In this day and age, I believe it is ill-advisable for a man to be, few, be weeks and weeks away from his wife. These men, by the way, these men nowadays, these evangelists, they don't stay in people's homes anymore. They're staying in hotel rooms by themselves or not by themselves. Mm-hmm. It is not wisdom from above, but you and I can chase dollars and dreams in our homes, turn into nightmares when we're not dwelling with them according to knowledge. Peter is trying to show us how to live with our wives. Most marriages do not work because the husband is never there. I've, I've known some men that hide behind headship, and they work 75 hours a week and are never home with their wives. Sleeping at the office. They talk a good game, though. Till you, fi- till you figure out that the reason they're doing it is because they can't bear to be with a brawling woman in a white house. It's a little too real, isn't it? <laughs> Keep moving. <laughs> see, see, I don't, I, I know, I don't have those fancy illustrations. From those books, I just use real, raw, true data right in your face. Especially when Pharisees talk a good game and then walk out the door with their tail between their legs. Because they're wrong, dead wrong. And they know it. Dwell with them, that is, let your manner of living with them be that which is immediately specified, according to knowledge, in accordance with an intelligent view of the nature of the relation, or as becomes those who have been instructed in the duties of this relation according to the gospel. The meaning evidently is this, that they should seek to obtain just views of what Christianity enjoins in regard to this relation, that they should allow those intelligent views to control them in all their contact contact with their wives. What does that mean exactly? It means that this book guides you on what a real marriage is. Not the world, not some stupid psychologist, not some stupid psychiatrist, Not somebody uh, based after the rudiments of this world, after the vain philosophies of men, right? 
not those things, but the Bible, the Word of God. I've had, I've had pastors that are doctors, doctors, tell me that, hey, listen, I have a degree in counseling. Whoa. Well, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Where should I bow? How far down should I go? I mean, do I bow the knee right here because you have a doctorate in psychology, in counseling? Yeah, and you and you use and you use man's understanding. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a Bible, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. You know what people hate today? Confidence in the Word of God. They hate boldness and confidence in the Word of God. You know who else hates it? Jezebels hate it. They don't like that confidence in the Word of God. No, they want you to back off. Just back down. Why do you get? Are you? Why do you get? So, you look upset. I said, "Hey, lady. No, you're just talking to a man. That thing next to you that's got his wrist bent like this." He's about that big? No, that guy. That guy right there? Yeah, no. That's why you're used to that. You drag him along like a little puppy dog. I just had a little bit of passion and actually spoke. I mean to scare you with a little bit of manhood. By the way, that's how the men are too today. They get a little scared. You're getting excited. I know. Sorry, I've been in the fluoride, I guess. So you don't like men getting excited. You ought to just back off and, you know, bend your wrists a little bit. Put on the skinny jeans. Talk like a queer and be scared of women, and you'll be just set. You'll be fine. No. I've dealt with enough Jezebels in my life to know that you can't just, uh, no. Just tell the truth. They don't like that. But the men are just as bad because when you start speaking bold, they don't like it either. If you preach against sin, oh, you're just proud. Yeah, I know, because it's a proudful thing to preach against sin. (laughs) That guy last night pointing that baseball bat, he came from church with, with his ushers. Anyway, but... Understanding what the Bible says is our authority for marriage and for and, and, and dwelling with them according to knowledge. Understanding it. What does that mean? According to knowledge of themselves and their wives and the duties belonging to the conjugal state. And the laws of God and man respecting it and according to their knowledge of the gospel and the Christian in this Christian era that we live in, which no ways breaks in upon, but strengthens and encourages to the observance of things belonging to the natural religion and civil life. According to the Bible, the superior knowledge of things, which generally speaking, men have to women as also wisely, prudently, becoming their characters as men. Men are to lead. They're to know the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, I mean, you can't lead your wife. According to knowledge. You don't even know the Word of God. I've had men tell me these same men, some of these men that say they're for headship and everything else. You just don't understand what it's like to to be married to a woman that knows her Bible that well. Why don't you? Yeah, it's kind of hard to, isn't it? I can't help it. It just comes out. It just pours out. It is true. The more wisdom the husband has, the more circumspectly he must behave himself in bearing those inconveniences which, through the woman's weakness, often cause trouble both to the husband and the wife. There are some weaknesses that a woman has as the weaker vessel, and it takes patience to deal with those things. You are to, you are to deal with them with patience. That's part of according to knowledge is being very patient with them through those weaknesses that they have. They are not able to bear the same infirmities that you are able to bear. They sometimes are not able to deal with those things. So you deal with them and dwell with them according to knowledge. Christian knowledge. 
appreciating the due relation of the sexes and the design of God. This, this is what's totally missed today, the absolute ignorance of that. I, I hardly, I rarely ever, if you even go through sermon audio for independent Baptists, now there's some reformed guys, some other guys, but Nate, you get to, if you go through sermon audio, you try to find the difference in the sexes and people preaching specifically on these things, you won't find a whole lot of Baptists preaching on those things. Independent Baptists. Why? They don't believe, it's not, it's not soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. That's why. It doesn't bring in the big money. It's not popular. Why? Because there might be a husband that's an effeminate Ahab, and, he, and he, he's going to get nailed. And there might be a Jezebel wife, and she's going to get nailed. So they go on with their fake relationship, wait till the kids get out of the house, and get divorced. And they don't love each other. And they go through life, and they don't love each other. They don't have a close, compassionate relationship. They don't have an endearing, loving relationship. Nope, they're just going through the motions, abiding their time, and just getting through things. That is no way to live, and that's not a marriage. And the reason it happens today so much in independent Baptist churches is because it's not being preached upon. And you're comfortable in your sin. And you're comfortable not understanding how to deal with a wife according to knowledge. You don't understand the difference of the sexes. And acting with tenderness and forbearance accordingly, wisely with wise consideration. That means you're very careful what you say. Josh was already hanging his head down. <laughs> you're very careful about those questions that you're asked and how you answer them. Does this make me look fat? Well, does she want the truth? <laughs> Do I need to repent? <laughs> There's a wise way to answer that question. <laughs> well, I will say this to you. You need to look at your wife and say, well, if it doesn't make you look modest, I don't think you should wear it. Amen. Now, what is that? It's a biblical answer. Yep, but it's biblical. If, it doesn't, if, if, if it's not modest, then you shouldn't wear it. Right? There you go. You are commanded to have good knowledge of your role as a husband and what God expects for her as a wife. And this cannot be overlooked or slighted. One of the biggest issues marriages face today, men and women not dwelling it accor together according to knowledge. The husband teaching and admonishing and nurturing and growing her. People today are ignorant of the roles of the husband and wife. When you send a wife to do what the husband should do, you lead into many problems. When a husband is attempting to do what the wife does, it leads into many problems. I want to tell you a story. I want you to listen. This is a real one. It's not, it's not an illustration. But it's, it's real life. I had somebody contact me, and I'm not going to mention any names out of respect. But I had somebody contact me, and they wanted, to, they wanted to live in America. Okay, They wanted to immigrate from another country, get trained into church, and live in America. The problem was the wife was the one that was going to get the degree, to go through college, to work. The husband... The husband was with four young girls, baby age and up, trying to care for them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No relief. No job. No way to get out of the house. No way to take care of anything like that. Now, a woman can do that. She can do that. She was made to do that. That's her role to do that. Now, not to never leave the house, I'm just saying. But that's, that's her role to do that, right? She can handle that. Like she can hear these different things going on and still be able to function. All right? I mean, even, even they get stressed out, obviously. But it, the point is that they can still do it. A man, 
It's not made for that. So they tried to reverse those roles. What happened? Tragedy happened. One of the children got hurt. He's in prison. Now, I'm not going to go into details because I allegedly I don't, I don't know all the facts and everything is just alleged. But I will say this, that a man is not meant to take that type of pressure. He's not meant to do that. A man is meant to go to work, deal with things, be away from that, come home, play with the children, spend time with them. But he's not to be around that all the time. He's not. God never made him that. You show me the Bible where a man was, did that anywhere, where that was his lot to do that. And wife, you better understand one thing. Your husband is not some male mom, okay? God didn't make him to go do all the things that you do and act like that's just the way it's supposed to be. No, that's not it. That doesn't mean he can't change a diaper, help out sometimes. But that's not what he's made to do. If you think that's what he's made to do, you're wrong, dead wrong. Because that's he's not a female, he's not a male mom, okay? That's not how it works, and that's not what he's supposed to do. That's not his duty to do that. Sorry, it's not. Doesn't mean he can't help. Doesn't mean he can't do things. Take his children out, play, and all those other things. But you know what? If you expect him to be that mom, you're wrong. It's not going to happen. He's not going to deal with things like a woman does because he wasn't meant to do it. So those roles are reversed. Now this man's going to go to prison, possibly. She's going to have to take the, the children and get out of there before that form of CPS over there decides that they want to take their children which they already did take them for a little while, for a short time. Now, it's all alleged. I don't, mean, I, I don't know the facts of everything, but I know enough of it. I understand enough of it from what I've heard to understand that I could have told them in three seconds what the problem was before it ever happened and, and that something like that was going to happen. Listen. We don't do things by any means necessary. We don't do the, ju the ends don't justify the means. We do things because they're biblical and they're correct. We don't, and then we expect God to bless and give the outcome there. We don't change things, change God's order and say, well, I'm working at it to get the right order, but I'm going to pervert God's order in order to get to God's order. No, it doesn't work that way. That's what happened, and you could foresee that happening. I, I, I could see that happening. A man's not meant to be in a place like that, a small little place taking care of four young children all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. He's not made for that. Bad idea. But who wants to talk about things like that anymore? It's like I had some man tell me that, you know, he down in Texas, he said, well, you know, I can't do that because... You know, I'd have to work like 15 hours a day or 12 hours a day. Okay, do it. God didn't make you to be a mom, to stay at home and be a mom and take care of children like you're a mom. You're not a mom. You're a dad. And they need their mother home with them. They need their mother nurturing them. They need their mother caring for them. That's what they need. They need a mom. I know. That's not popular because we've all evolved. And even Baptists have evolved so far that we don't even believe that God is right anymore. When you preach about it, it starts clearing out the house because people don't like to. Well, you'll come to this church because you love the truth. You'll come to this church because you want to hear the truth. And you want God's order. And you want God's, God's way of doing things. Otherwise, you'll just go somewhere else where you're more comfortable. That's about 11 out of the 12 churches in the city. You cannot be Mr. Mom and Mrs. Dad. It's an imbalance, and it is not dwelling together according to knowledge. It is not understanding. It is chaos. But it's not popular, and people don't like that. Well, you don't like God is what you're saying, and you won't like heaven either. And you're probably not going to end up there. Because you're rebellious and stiff-necked and you hate God's order completely. You know what? It, it, there's a lot of women out there 
that when they hear things like this, it upsets them. It ought not. You ought to thank God that there's a man that wants to take care of you and do things right and, and to keep you home with the children and everything else because that's what God made you for. Problem is, you've bought into Satan's lie. Yea, hath God said. God told, or the, the, uh, God told you this is his order, this is the way of being. Satan whispered in your ear. Ah, there's a better life out there for you. You can have a degree, a career, and you can move up, and you can make good money, and you can do all these things. It isn't that much more than being some simpleton with no shoes on, barefoot and pregnant, making cookies in the kitchen. <laughs> I like cookies, so it sounds good to me. <laughs> right? And most people that are barefoot all the time are healthy. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. I appreciate the stamp of approval. I needed that clarification. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> clarification? I can spell that. Yeah? Just not right now. Anyway. Think about it, though. It's looked down upon, these things. But women, you are being robbed. You're being robbed. The world is robbing you of the place that God puts you and wants to steal it away from you. Eve fell for it in the garden, and millions have fell for it today. Ye husbands, duties of Christian husbands are now briefly stated. They are to dwell with their wives. The fact that their wives are unconverted is no ground for separation. But if the wife is converted, still stronger is the bond. What he's saying is that you don't have to leave your wife if you get saved and she doesn't. You dwell with her and try to help her and teach her the gospel and, and, and pray for her to be saved. But you have to be there. You have to spend time at home. You have to spend time with your wife. You've got to dwell with them. You know, I, again, I'm going to say this, and I've, I've warned people before, they've not listened to me, and everybody that I've seen not listen ends up in trouble. I'm dead set against new couples and husbands having a third shift job. Absolutely dead set against it. 100% against it. When somebody walks up to me and asks me, should I do this? No. No. Find something else. No. Nope. People are, people are spo you're supposed to be sleeping at night. And when you're not sleeping at night, trouble comes. Lots of it. And when you try to wake up, and you try, or you try to sleep during the day when you come home, then, then you're cranky, and you don't want to be a newly married man and be cranky all the time, not have good quality time to spend with your family around you and everything else like that because you're, you're cranky. I've seen, I, I can tell you, of a mar I know of a marriage in Washington that a man did that. It got, it, he, he had to get sleep. He was working on this oil rig, making a lot of money. He was working this third shift, right? And he had to get sleep. So you know what he did? He had his wife, during the day, take their son and go over to mom and dad's house and spend the whole day over there. And he spent no time with them. And time went on and time went on and time went on. She took the kid. She, got, she had full custody of him. She kept him away. She divorced him. He shouldn't have worked third shift. He shouldn't have been, he shouldn't have been, because he, you know, children are loud. No matter how quiet they are, they're still loud. Right? I know another man did the same thing. First got married, took a third shift job, ended up going nuts. He was already nuts anyway, in my opinion, but this just made it worse. Yeah. But it wrecks the marriage bed. It makes men grouchy and they get less sleep and the family time suffers because of it. I believe you're to dwell with them. Be there and comfort your wife and spend time with her. The other aspect of this is the weaker vessel dwelling with her according to knowledge of her being the weaker vessel. The husband's fear in the home. I want to read you this because I believe it's important. The true home is the brightest spot since the Garden of Eden. But it does not make itself or come by chance. In building a glad and happy household, each one has a part to perform. And God's choicest blessings come only when all the members stand in their place and do their duty. The happy home grows, grows out of a union of hearts and hands toward one cherished end. One person alone may do much, but no one can do all that is required. 
The best is only when there is sympathetic and harmonious blending together like the different parts of music. When either part fails, there is discord and loss. Complete concert of action between husband and wife is a necessity in any well-ordered home. Perfect confidence and affection must, be, must exist between them. To draw apart tears, to make the home the happiest and most helpful place in the world, each must give the best to it. Not to society, not to business, not to outside intimates, but to the family circle must the choicest gleanings be brought from all the fields of life. And as the bee brings to his hive, and not elsewhere, honey from all the sweetest flowers. The husband has an important sphere. The more he gives to the home, the more it will give to him. The more he is to, to it, the more it will be to him and to the world. His dividend will be in the proportion to his investment. You listening? Some complain that their home joys are meager. Let them remember how mean and beggarly are their contributions. You get what you put into it. Right? They cannot reap where they do not sow. If they will, they can make the home a source of perennial comfort to themselves and the means of blessing to many. It should be a bright beacon in this world's night. The word husband means a house band, a band of strength around the home, upholding, protecting, and keeping it together. The home was the first institution God made. The germs of the state and the church are in it. The husbands, as the head of the home, stands at the beginning of all the worthiest elements of society. You have no good government without good homes. You have no good civil government. You have no good anything without good homes. Churches will not be strong without good homes. Amen. In the household, he plants the seeds of religion for the church and the authority for the state. The family is the springhead of the nation, the source of its purest spiritual and civil life. It is plain what manner of man the husband ought to be. The husband in the model home must love his wife. Paul says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. These are strong words, Bible words. The Bible is the marriage ring. Marriage begins in love. It must continue and end there. The husband must see that the early tender affection never fails. That the gentle tone of life's mourning does not grow harsh. He must love the wife down through old age and on, and on through fading youthful beauty to the sunset years. With a love that marks wrinkles beautiful and infirmities seem precious. Tell her how much you love her still. Tell it more and more as the years go on. Never allow the white roses of affection to fade on your lips and your mouth to grow dumb. A cold silence is a mildew. Some wives would be surprised to hear expressions of endearment from their husbands now. All that ceased long, long ago. Let the husband show his love by his presence, not leaving her, and deserting the home the long evening through when he can help it. Let the husband cherish his wife and appreciate what she does, causing her to feel that he sees and esteems her service. Let little attentions never cease, nor delicate thoughtfulness for her welfare. Let the husband shelter his wife under his strong arm and smooth her path. Let him protect her and stand by her in her cares and trials and know that she will never look to him in vain. Let him provide for her reasonable wants that she come not into embarrassment and feel that he demeans her. Ill temper and hasty words on his part, these are not for the happy home. Some seem to be more considered of their horse and dog than of their wives. But many a husband is a mule. The true husband will be mindful of his wife's good and not indifferent to her. For in his smile she lives and in his frown is chill. A husband's love is the sunshine of the wife. It brings out her beauty of soul and a spring morning opens the flowers and sustains her in her deepest needs. Selfishness and disregard to the interests and happiness of the wife, planting one's own self in the center and absorbing every good thing in one's own greed, the wife drudging and denying herself for her husband as the slave for his Lord, running to serve his every whim. This is not found on heathen ground alone. There are home heathens. Genuine love casts out selfishness and ennobles the heart. It makes it generous and self-denying for all other sakes. Husbands, love your wives. There are some of the benefits that flow out of the domestic love, and in proportion as this love ceases, these benefits fail. What if love has ceased already? Do these things and it will come back as the seeds begin to open when the spring sun shines again. Think about that. A lot of wisdom there. 
Next, we are to dwell with them according to knowledge of her being the weaker vessel. The Bible says that she is the weaker vessel. So then we must use knowledge and special care as we deal with our wives. We are both to be vessels of honor unto the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. The weaker the vessel, the more tenderly it should be treated. Think about that. Husbands, this is God's command for you, that you treat her kind and tenderly, not coarse or rough or abrasive. That's not how you treat a delicate vessel. Think about that. Even if they're not delicate, that's right. If they don't appear to be delicate, they are. Because the Bible says that they are. Expecting your wife to be tough like you in certain areas is not dwelling with them according to knowledge as the weaker vessel. She wasn't made like you. You can't expect her to be like you. And really, you don't want her to be like you. Right? Because that'd be kind of ugly. Right? Yeah. The weaker vessel, the more tenderly it should be treated. The husband must treat his wife with thoughtful consideration for being the weaker vessel. Dwell with the woman according to knowledge, knowing they are weak and therefore to be used with all tenderness, yet do not despise them for this. You don't, you don't despise them for their weaknesses. Do you understand that? They have certain weaknesses. You don't go to your friends and complain about your wife's weaknesses. Oh, man. man. She's been nagging me. Or, man. I don't like this about her, that about her, that. But... No. Nope. That's right. That's right. That's not dwelling with her according to knowledge. And I'll tell you one thing. Not talking to the person you have the problem with doesn't do any good. It's just complaining. Deal with the person you have the problem with. If it's possible, and in a husband and wife it is possible, that you deal tenderly with it. Moreover, he employs a twofold argument in order to persuade husbands to treat their wives honorably and kindly. The first is derived from the weakness of the sex. The other from the honor with which God favors them. These things seem indeed to be in a manner contrary, that honor ought to be given to wives because they are weak and because they excel. But these things well agree together where love exists. It is evident that God is despised in his gifts, except we honor those on whom he has conferred any excellency. Think about that. But when we consider that we are members of the same body, we learn to bear with one another and mutually to cover our infirmities. This is what Paul means. Turn to 1 Corinthians. I want to show you something. This is a perfect example of what Paul is talking about in the body of Christ, the local New Testament church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 23. Oh, look at verse number 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... Upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. If they're weaker, great care ought to be taken for them. Do you understand that? Because we, Even because we are more careful protecting them from shame. Then Peter does not without reason command the woman should be cared for and that, that she should be honored with a kind treatment because they are weak. And then as we more easily forgive children when they offend through inexperience of age, so the weakness of the female sex ought to make us not to be too rigid and severe towards our wives. Right? As the weaker vessel being more delicately and consequently more slenderly constructed, roughness and strength go hand in hand. So likeness do beauty and frailty. 
The female has what the man wants, beauty and delicacy. The male has what the female wants, courage and strength. The one is as good in its place as the other. That's why you're one. And you that are strong ought to what? Bear the infirmities of the weak. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. Think about this this way, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The wife is called a vessel, and here weaker, being so for the most part, both as to strength of body and endowments of mind, and therefore to be used gently and tenderly, and not to be treated with neglect and contempt, or with inhumanity and severity, but as in every state and condition the strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak, so a man should bear with and accommodate himself to the infirmities of his wife. And hide them as much as he can, and not expose them, nor despise her on account of them. You don't share all the weaknesses of your wife with everybody. Doesn't mean sometimes you don't ask for advice privately. It's understandable, nothing wrong with that. But you don't parade around your wife's weaknesses to everyone, her infirmities to everyone. No, you're to cover them, and you're to deal with them in private. You're not to despise them. I like it how this man put it. As into weaker vessels, glasses, this is what uh, Trapp said, glasses are to be tenderly handled. A small knock soon breaks them. So will, and wilt thou not for the honor of marriage cast away thy harshness, roughness, cruelty? Think about this. What is he saying? He's saying if you have something that's glass and it's, it's tender, right? You know that it's fragile and it could break, right? Then you as a man ought to understand a wife as a weaker vessel that she is fragile and she can break. So there are things that you must protect her from. And you are to be that, that kind of wrap around her that protects the glass to keep it from shattering. You keep her from breaking and being damaged. That's why there are things that have, and I'm, I've learned this more, I'm learning it more, in this ministry is I have so many people shooting at me constantly from all different angles. I, I've tried to shield my wife more from that now. That she doesn't hear that constant criticism of her husband constantly and about everything. I, I don't tell her about a lot of that stuff. I try to keep that from her. Why? Because God didn't make her to bear that. He made me to. And I don't need to tell her that. I can tell you guys that. <laughs> right? Bear ye one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So I tell you. Right? You can handle it. You're going to have to because it's going to come your way. If you're going to be in the ministry, it's going to come your way. If you're going to do something for God, it's going to come your way. But they're to be shielded from that. Your family's not to experience all that. Wow, that was pretty good. I thought that was Joshua was so loud. Did you hear that, Joshua? Did you hear that, Garrett? That was impressive. He takes after you. The beard's coming. It's only a matter of time. We'll call him uh, Sergeant Extreme or something. <laughs> right? Anyway. But 
We are to shield our wives from those things, right? Because glasses are to be tenderly handled. So if they are a weaker vessel, then we don't put all that upon them. Right? We understand that. The fact is unquestionable that a woman is less robust in constitution, less powerful in muscularity, and of more delicate nervous organization than men. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Sure is. Well, it's just like I saw that, you know, when I did that report a long time ago, I think I think you were with me, Brother Nate, when I did that. When we did that report on that UFC fighter. That was, I did that by myself, that he was a man, and he became a well, he tried to become a woman, and he just crushed this lady's face, broke all the bones in her face and everything else because he was fighting a female fighter. Why? Because she's not built like that. She's not made like that. So he fought a woman, and he crushed her. Now, many people will use that weakness to their advantage in dealing in an abusive and mean spirit and overbearing, threatening way with a woman because she's a weaker vessel. So Peter has given instructions so this doesn't happen and has instructed men that they sh- should not do what the heathens do, shouldn't do what Islam does. If a woman's in public, well, she's automatically guilty, so you can rape her and you can do whatever you want to with her, and then you just cut her head off and throw her in the street and kill her. That's not Christianity. That's not submission. That's not, that's not the, the husband and the wife dwelling according to knowledge as under the wife as under the weaker vessel. That's not. No, it's abuse. Yeah, it's devil possession. That's right. It's hating your own flesh, the Bible says. Not nourishing and cherishing it. What is it? It's the opposite of love. It's hate. They don't love anybody. They just use women. Yeah, brute beasts that are made to be destroyed. That's right. Yep, yeah, that's right. Wicked. Men, men, irresponsible power and selfishness lead to female degradation. This is not the submission found in the Bible. When you dwell with your wife according to knowledge, you understand who your wife is, and you study her according to the Scriptures. Men should get their knowledge of, of, of a lady from the Bible, not from psychology and other humanistic materials and philosophies. Oh, I've got to take Tim LaHaye's psychiatry test or whatever that he had, his compatibility test. Yeah, Tim LaHaye. Yeah, you got to know your five love languages. I, hey, listen, I've seen fundamental Baptist pastors use those materials, right? Yeah. What was that other book that was used? Do you remember the other one? There was another book that was used. Same modern-day new evangelical book used in Baptist churches. I, I was there. I was got the lessons at this Baptist church where they sent these, and they were teaching couples to this class is these five love languages and all this other garbage. I don't know. I didn't listen. I, I, I didn't listen. I don't know what it was. I just didn't listen to it because I thought it was stupid psychology garbage from the pit of hell. It's just really dumb. And then they have, and they, they, it's all this psycho babble. It's where, they, it's where they'd say, well, Mary, you're equal partners, and you make decisions together, and you do this this way. And You do? Where do you find it in the Bible? Where, where do you find any of that in the Word of God? And guess what? You don't. It's not the proper order or biblical understanding of it. Let me ask you a question. Do you know your wife's spiritual weakness? Do you know where she's spiritually weak? Do you know where there are weaknesses in her life spiritually as well as a mother or as a wife? And are you nurturing and caring and trying to instruct her in those things? Understanding where some things are not right and dealing with them? Do you know where those are? Or are you not able to spiritually discern anything because you're not working on yourself? Because you don't even look in the Bible long enough to know anything about you. So how can you help her? Do you know her character flaws and her failures? Do you know what makes her angry and what makes her happy? Do you dwell with her according to knowledge? How can two people be on the same journey and never talk to each other or know each other? Hmm? Hmm? 
But I'll tell you one thing, the trip is sure happier when you know each other and have fellowship one with another. Just because you and I are leaders doesn't mean that we are given the authority to provoke them to anger and wrath or mistreat them as the weaker vessel. Taking advantage of them because they can't, after all, they're married to you, so they can't do anything if they want to obey God. They just have to put up with it and forbear it. That's not, that's not right. That's not biblical marriage. That's not dwelling with them according to knowledge as the as unto the wife is the weaker vessel. Yes, Sarah was submissive to Abraham, but he was not a tyrant to her. Bible says, give honor unto the wife. Treat them with due civility and respect in the ordinary intercourse of life. To give honor unto them. Now that, that, number one, that means, obviously, that word honor means to care for. It means to take care of. It means to supply the needs of. Just like you honor your father and your mother, that's the same thing. That's what, uh, Pastors are worthy of double honor, the Bible says, right? Those, they that labor in doctrine and the word, right? So there's, that's, that, there's that. Also, but it's that respect. We are to respect them and love them. To show honor to someone is not always to show subjection to them, but to honor to whom honor is due. As joint heirs, which we'll talk about another day. Giving honor unto the wife, not despising them because of their weakness. Or using them as slaves. But respecting them and caring for them. Using them gently, covering their infirmities. Giving honor, due respect, kind attention, and affectionate assistance, such as love guided by wisdom dictates. There's more than just getting married and putting a ring on the finger. It's work. It's work. Giving honor, reverent regard, and respectful treatment. Right? So you say, yeah, but you preach about being the leader and being the head of the home and all those things. Yeah, but that doesn't negate any responsibility to be respectful and kind and loving and tender and careful as how you treat them. Why do we have to, why do we go to extremes in this nation uh, where if somebody preaches something like this, it means that you're a mean tyrant bully that doesn't let anybody uh, do anything or make any decisions or you're just, you know, that's just the way it is. What's that? And you hate women. Yeah, you just hate women. That's what your problem is. You just hate women because you want them to be in the order of the Bible. So you just hate them. You have a, that's oppression. I feel sorry for those women. They're oppressed. Yeah, they look like it. <laughs> Just look miserable. Huh? They do. Look, none of them smile. Look. <laughs> They're all laughing at me now. Right? They're just so oppressed. Yours is so fresh, you didn't show up today. What happened? (laughs) You're not allowed to talk. Reverent regard and respectful treatment. You know, those in leadership, it's it's like somebody said, well, yeah, they don't like biblical leaders, they don't like biblical pastors today, they hate leaders, period, right? Any type of biblical authority at all, they hate. Whether it's the church's authority, whether it's pastoral authority, whatever it is, they hate it. So they automatically tie that into being a bully or being um, mean-spirited or being controlling or, or any of those things. They automatically make that assertion. Right? Automatically. Because there's some order, it must be wicked. must be op- oppressive. Why? Because we live in the era of do without wilt shall be the whole law. 
That's what we live in today. And even most churches live that way. Where husbands and wives are not on the same path. They are not going the same direction. They are not, they are not together following, following the Lord. They're just not. Giving honor to the wife, using your superior strength and experience in her behalf, and thus honoring her by becoming her protector and support. But the word honor signifies maintenance as well as respect. Maintain and provide for the wife, both things. Respect, honor, maintain, provide. All of those things. Giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel. It was an, an important advance made in society when the Christian faith gave such a direction as this. For everywhere among the pagan and under all false systems of religion, women, woman has been regarded as worthy of little honor or respect. She has been considered as a slave or as a mere instrument to gratify the passions of man. By the way, that's what pornography does too. All it is, a woman, all she is, is is to gratify the passions of a man. When you get stuck in pornography, that's the opposite of the Christian faith. That's why it's so devilishly wicked. She's been considered as a slave or as a mere instrument to gratify the passions of a man. It is one of the elementary doctrines of Christianity, however, that woman is to be treated with respect. And one of the first and most marked effects of religion on society is to elevate the woman to a condition in which she will be worthy of esteem. The particular reasons for the honor which husbands are directed to show to their wives here specified are two. She is to be treated with special kindness as being more feeble than man and as having a claim, therefore, to delicate attention. And she is to be honored as the equal heir of the grace of life. That's where it's equal as joint heirs. In eternity. Higher duty than that of merely providing for the temporal needs of the wife and giving her honor and strikes at a deeper evil than a mere neglect of meeting her temporal necessities. The reasons assigned for doing so, this seem to be to imply that to honor her as the weaker vessel is to know her faults and her failures and not to expose them for the world to see. The Bible says, and above all things, Colossians 3.14, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. See, as understanding a weaker vessel, I, I look at her, I understand her faults. I'm not blinded to them. I understand they're there. Right? And I deal with those faults privately, with respect. And with much patience. Why? Because this is not somebody that you just meet on the street that you're rebuking. This is somebody that you are spending your life with. This is someone that you have an ongoing relationship with that will be until you die. So you have to take great care in that relationship, in building it, in making it stronger, in bearing with her infirmities, in having patience and meekness, in dealing with her, and giving her time, and praying for her. That has to happen, friend. That's marriage. It's not just you get married and you sleep with some woman, and that's just the way life goes. You just go on like that. So many people think that. And if you're young here and you have, get the, you have this desire to be married and all you can think about is the marriage bed and everything else, you better start thinking about everything else that goes on to it. Because there's a lot more to it than just that. A whole lot more to it than just that. It's somebody you've got to dwell with and give your heart to and share your life with. And things aren't going to always be perfect. You're going to have struggles and problems and trials. And then the children come, and there's more challenges, troubles, and trials, and expenses, and expenses, and expenses, and expenses. <laughs> Take it up a special offering. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now it's time to slip that in. <laughs> Yeah, a diaper offering. <laughs> if you have a newborn, you'll understand why. Every five minutes, they get a new one. <laughs> yeah. 
And if they don't, you're all in trouble. To honor her is to esteem her and love her, and it will cover the multitude of sins. Men, that means that you will not let others speak evil of your wife, that you'll be careful not to be hard and rigid with her. You know, chivalry should never be dead among Baptist men in their marriages. Your wife is the weaker vessel in physical stature, and you should not expect her to be a man. You should expect her to, to, to lift everything, do everything, and act every way that you do. It's not, you shouldn't. Yeah, you don't look at her and say, buck up, Sally. Right? That's right. Yeah, but that's why we tell men to buck up and call him Sally. We teach our young boys that you help your mother carry this. You help your, you do this. You, you help them. We teach them that. We help them. We do those things. We help them. Right? Just little things. You honor and respect her and pay special attention to her as the weaker vessel. Helping her and working on her spiritual needs. Asking her, you know what? Here's part of your duty as the weaker vessel. You need to make sure, hey, are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you reading your Bible? Have you been in your Bible? Have you been praying? It's your duty to do that. Of course, you probably don't want to ask that question if you're not doing it. So you probably won't ask that question if you're not doing it. So you're like, I'm not going to ask that. Because if I ask her if she's doing it, I'll feel like a hypocrite. I'm not going to ask that. That's right. She does know when you're not. So you think about the fact that you... As the weaker vessel, you've got to make sure spiritually she's walking with the Lord. See, one of the things, one of the problems is that you, you think that as a husband that, that, you know, you're going to go out, just like preaching out there. We go out and preach, but you better make sure your wife is in prayer and she's reading her Bible and she's staying strong. Because you know what? As we go preach and do these things, you know what? They have to be strong. They need to be in their Bibles. They need to be teaching your children the Word of God. They need to be actively involved with the Word of God and teaching their children and learning and growing themselves. That needs to be part of that. If it's not, you have one side that's doing something, the other that's not. You're not together as one. And there's a neglect in your duty. So before you go out and preach, you ought to make sure your wife is at least in her Bible and you're discipling the one next to you, the one that's a part of you, the one that's one flesh with you. Privately rebuking her and trying to aid her in her Christian growth. And lastly here, and we're done, that your prayers be not hindered. This this is so overlooked most of the time. We talk about, give a lot of lip service in America to revival in the churches. I'm going to tell you something. If I walked into that meeting and preached a message like this, or a message like husbands love your wives, or any of those marriage messages into that camp meeting with all those people there, I guarantee you there is a room full of Jezebels in there. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because they all jumped on me when I got online and I put that stuff online. They all just shoo, just jumped on it. Yeah, and then you hear them yell in the service. What was that yell they do, Nate? Oh, you can't yell. You have, you have him. There was this weird yell they do. What they do? It kind of. Can you do that yell for me? It sounds like a suey or something. You know, like a. What is it? You can do it. Do it. No, louder. I can't hear that. See, that sounds like a pig squealing to me or something. Oh, was there another sound that they made? Uh, never mind the Bible says that women are to be silent in church. Never mind. That's just... Yeah, that's true. But no, this was in, the, this was in one of the meetings, right? Revival meetings, right? But listen, the point is, I, how many of those... How many of those husbands and wives are not dwelling together according to knowledge? How many of them are not even getting along? Some of them aren't even sleeping with their wives. Some of them are forced to sleep in the basement in another bed. Yep, yep. Some of them are for they don't they don't even sleep in the same bed with their wife. Their wife doesn't even let them in bed with them, and they go to church. They show up to churches like this all the time. Well, not like this, but they wouldn't probably wouldn't stay this portion. of yeah, and they go there and they hoop and they holler and they run around and they squeal like pigs and do all that. My man and all that other stuff and and then they're doing all, and then 
What's going on at home? They go home, and the relationship is cold as ice. The wife is not giving herself to the husband. No. They're not. And by the way, we're gonna, I'm going to preach. That's, that's one of the sermons coming. Defraud you, you're not yourselves, right? Let Satan not tempt you for your incontinency. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach on that sometime. But you know what? That, that's happening there. And the, the husband and wife's relationship are horrible. They fight all the time. They argue all the time. They don't, they don't even stay around each other all the time. They stay away from each other. They don't get along. They're always biting and devouring each other. And they just dwell in their marriage like that and act like that's normal. Like it's normal to be at odds with your wife all the time. And they go to Baptist churches. They get up there. They say amen. They throw money in the offering plate. Their ch- children are part of the youth group. They're doing all that. And meanwhile, they're praying for revival. Well, don't kid yourself. That's a joke. If you want revival, it's God's people getting right with God. And it's, it's preaching like this that deals with the sins of husbands and wives and their marriages not being after the order of Scripture and the, the roles not being right and all of those things that dig to the heart of that. And when men get this right and women get this right and their hearts get changed, then you see revival. Then you see a spiritual moving of God. But you're not going to see it until that takes place. Why? Because your prayers are hindered. God's not answering those prayers. They're bouncing off the wall, bouncing off the ceiling. God's not answering those prayers. Because you don't even write with your husband and wife. You don't even dwell with them according to knowledge. You're not even right there. And you expect you're going to have revival like that? I wouldn't. If, if my marriage was so miserable, I wouldn't even show up to a revival meeting. I'd stay home. Why fake it? Yeah, what am I going to go for? Maybe for the buffet or something. I don't know. Potluck. Or... The barbecue or something, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's tempting. <laughs> Scripture here states that the married couple's prayers will be hindered if the husband and wife relationship is not followed according to the Scriptures. That it was supposed there would be unity or family prayer. It's one thing I've been working on lately that I have not done enough of with my children is teaching them to pray now more. They're getting at the age where they can understand, where they can pray a little bit. The two oldest ones, the younger ones, are still kind of not really understanding, you know, too much. But the, but the younger ones are starting to say it. So we're having a time of family prayer as well as, as the Bible time that we normally do. Um, and we're adding a lot more prayer to that because our family needs more prayer. We need more time together. So I've been working on that recently and getting that right with God and, and trying to build that in my home. Um, so our children, our whole family understands that we all pray, each our children. You know, that they understand it now. As the two are old enough, uh, the two oldest ones, they're starting to pray, you know, and try to get them focused, you know. It's, it's different when it comes to prayer with little children, you know. But you need to pray, amen? And pray with your wife as well, obviously. The apostle is speaking of dwelling with the wife and of the right manner of treating her, and it is plainly supposed that united prayer would be one thing that would characteristic, characterize their living together. Praying. Praying together. He does not direct that there should be prayer. He seems to take it for granted that there would be prayer. He's already taken it for granted that their prayers be not hindered because they're already praying. So if you're going to pray, you might as well not have them hindered. Right? And it may, it may be remarked that where there is true religion and right exercise, there is prayer as a matter of course. The head of the family does not ask whether he must establish family worship. He does it as one of the spontaneous fruits of the faith, as a thing concerning which no formal command is necessary. Prayer in the family, as everywhere else, is a privilege. And the true question to be asked on the subject is not whether a man must, but whether he may pray. It is implied that there might be such a way of living as effectually to hinder prayer. That is, to prevent its being offered a right and to prevent any answer. This might occur in many ways. If the husband treated the wife unkindly, and if he did not show her proper respect and affection, if there were bickerings and jealousies and contentions between them, there could be no hope that acceptable prayer would be offered. A spirit of strife, irritability, and unevenness of temper, harsh looks and unkind words... A disposition easily to take offense and an unwillingness to forgive. All these prevent a return of prayers. It's interesting. Um, 
I'll give you an example. About two weeks ago, we had just had a lot of stuff going on, you know, back and forth, getting ready for a funeral, all this other stuff happening. And my wife came to me in private, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm noticing there's, there's a problem here with the children, with everybody. Everybody's being really short with each other. They're being very irritable and very short with each other. And I said, you know what, you're right. We're, we're all being kind of short with each other. And so then I took the children, I took the family, and I sat them down. I said, listen, um, I want to ask your forgiveness because I've been short with you. And I, I, I haven't been patient. And we all are not being patient with each other. We're being too short, too irritable with each other. And we need to get that right with God. So first thing I did was my wife and I, we prayed together. Then we brought the kids in and we prayed with them together. And we got it right. We dealt with it. And she was right to do that because she noticed it, that it was there and it's a problem. She didn't go to the kids and say, hey, your dad's being irritable. No, she said, hey, we're all... <laughs> Pray for your dad. <laughs> He's really mad right now. Pray for him. He's angry. <laughs> His wrath is coming. No. No, but we were all just being very short. We were just hurried, trying to get everything done. And you know what happens? Sometimes you, you, you do. You just allow yourself to get into the flesh and you're getting irritable and you, you don't have any right to be that way with each other. So what's the best thing to do? You gotta get right with God. You gotta pray. You got to bring the Holy Spirit into it. Amen? Ask God to forgive you. Ask, and do that in front of your children so they see that. So your wife sees now. I could have said to her, woman, you don't know what you're talking about. Get in there and make me some biscuits and take them shoes off. <laughs> it, was, it was just too easy. I had to throw it in there. Um, but no, I, I could have said that, and I would look like a fool, but I could have said that. But no, you know what? You listen. Like, that's right. Amen. That is true. And if you're going to be a spiritual leader, then you've got to admit your failures. Right. And you've got to say, you know what, honey? You're right. And I'm going to blame myself for this, and we're going to get it right. So we sat there, and we got it right. Amen. And it changed the demeanor of the whole day. Amen. So that's, that's dwelling with them according to to knowledge. Amen? Acceptable prayer never can be offered in the tempest of passion. And there could be no doubt that such prayer is often hindered by the inequalities of temper and the bickerings and strifes that exist in families. Yet how desirable is it that husband and wife should so live together that their prayers be not hindered? How desirable for their own peace and happiness in that relation? How desirable for the welfare of children? Husband and wives ought not be at each other's throats. Ought not be arguing in front of the children, yelling, screaming, hollering. Right? Got to get it right. Got to stop it right where it is and get it right. Why? Because your children hear that. You think your children are supposed to... You, you don't think it affects them? Oh, it affects them. Now, if you get it right, it'll be okay. If you sit them down and you get, them, get it right, you admit your faults, you admit your failures. I've had my wife do that before where she... Maybe answered me a little bit out of line like she shouldn't have. You know, and some, something. She sat down and she said, I'm wrong. I told the children that was wrong. She should have done that. Well, why do you do that? Because it's the right thing to do. And they see that. Oh, that's not normal. Mom and dad don't normally ever do that. But just something happened. They, and we got to get it right. Those are important. It's important to do that. You say, why are you telling all your faults? I'm just telling you the truth, okay? I'm not going like, to act fake with you and act like nothing, like everything's always perfect. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I, I, we don't have, we've never had a problem with any, you know, ferocious arguing since I've been married. Um, I remember one time, my wife says she doesn't remember this, and I thank God for it. One time, <laughs> I'm really glad she doesn't remember this, but one time I remember raising my voice, and it was like, to her, and it was like, it was literally like the first year of our marriage. And it wasn't really like this terrible thing or other, but I, I remember doing it. And I, I just immediately came under conviction, was, was very convicted over it, and asked her forgiveness and was really broken over it. And she doesn't even remember it, um, but I'm glad she doesn't. But it, it affected me enough to where I saw it, and it bothered me greatly. And so I'm saying, I, I, we haven't had those problems through the years like that, but 
in 14 years of marriage, we really haven't had a lot of that. But if even a little thing happens, you've got to get it taken care of. You can't just go on with that and act like that's okay. Like you can just get away with that. It's not right. You deal with it. You're human. You're going to get in the flesh. You're going to fail. It's not an excuse. It's reality. When you do, you get it right. You don't overlook anything like that, but you get it right. One of the reasons our nation's our nation is so in trouble today is that our families are in trouble. And our prayers are hindered because the husband and wife relationships are not right. You you're not going to have any power of God if your relationship at home is not right. You can preach all you want to on the streets, but if your marriage is in a mess, you're not going to have any power. Your words are going to fall on deaf ears. It's not going to have power. That your prayers be not hindered as they would be, were they not to dwell together. Should not the husband give honor to the wife and take care of her as he ought to do? Hence would arise strifes and quarrels when they could not cordially and to edification join together in prayer. Nor would such prayers put up in the wrath be acceptable unto God, who requires that men should lift up holy hands everywhere, whether in public or in private, in God's house or in their own houses, without wrath and doubting. From hence we may observe that family prayer is a duty incumbent on professors of religion, and great care should be taken that it be not neglected or hindered. Man, I'm trying to hurry here and get you through this. That your prayers be a mutual prayer is not possible unless there is mutual love and forbearance. Nor can the husband's prayers be acceptable unless he treats his wife right. Isaac prayed in the presence of his wife. This course of praying together apart from others, being taken up by married couples, will much increase and spiritualize their affection one to another. But jarring will make them leave praying, or praying leave jarring. It's kind of hard to be upset with each other when you're holding the hands praying. Amen. Not easy, is it? You know what it does? It breaks down that barrier that's there of a lack of communication when you grab your wife's hand and say, you know what? Things are out of balance. Let's start praying. Woo! What happened? You just brought the Holy Ghost into that. You ain't going to get away with anything now. You're going to be bearing your heart and getting right with God, and she's going to be bearing her heart and getting right with God, and you're going to have some communication, and things are going to work. Amen. I know this is long, but I think it's necessary. I believe it's absolutely necessary. I've seen too many sham marriages out there. Bunch of fake, phony marriages that aren't even working according to the scriptures, and that nobody loves each other. They're bitter, they're angry, they're full of wrath, malice, hate, anger, strife, discord, backbiting. That's right. How can we see a spiritual revival when our prayers are not even being answered? They're not even being heard. If the wife is not submitting to her own husband, and the husband is not honoring the wife as the weaker vessel and dwelling with her according to knowledge, our prayers are not answered. You know what God is really saying to us? Get real. You don't really want anything from me when you ignore my design for marriage, the family, and the home. How can you say you want revival? How can you say you want anything from me when you don't even obey what I've plainly taught you right here to do? I'm not even answering your prayers. I'm not even hearing your prayers. They're hindered. It's very simple, isn't it? Why would I send revival to a people who don't want it? And when you openly defy the scriptures and God's order for marriage, you don't want revival. And you're not going to get it. You want your country to get better? It all starts with the foundation. Make America great again? Give me a break. How about you make marriage great again? Huh? How about you start with that? Amen? How about you take great care? If these pe- these political people dealt as much with their own marriages as they do with trying to get Donald Trump or any other of these, these uh, actors into, into, into office. Man, we'd have a revival. If all these Christians work as hard as they are politically, spiritually, and on their own homes, wow, we'd see the move of God. It wouldn't matter who got in there. God would push his agenda straight through, and we'd see revival like you'd never seen before, just like a great awakening that took place. What happened? Because some people got right with God. Some dead old religious people got saved by the grace of God and got on fire for God. Some people that were living in sin got on fire for God. And what happened? It swept across the nation. And then it affected a nation and a world. Because that's real awakening and revival. 
but it's getting these things right with God, getting our marriages right, that our prayers be not hindered. You're praying for all these other things. You better start fixing your home. You better start working on your marriage. You better start getting that right. How can you expect to, to save anybody else or see anybody else saved when you're not even dealing with your own home? See to thy own house. See to thine own house. Father, Lord, thank you. Lord, I know it was long, but it was necessary. It's needed, and it needs to be more. I need to preach more on marriage, Lord. Absolutely more and more and more and more it's needed. Because we are totally ignorant today of what God expects from us in marriage. And defining these, line upon line, and precept upon precept, and dealing with these things, Lord, to help strengthen homes. The stronger the marriage, the stronger the church, the stronger the nation. And Lord, maybe, just maybe, we'll see a lot of people stay married and not get divorced when they understand their biblical responses. Maybe they won't enter into it lightly as these young men and young women are here today and they want to be married, they have a desire to be married. But they enter in with full knowledge, understanding their roles and their duties before God. Help us, dear God. Help us that have been married for a while, Lord, not to get stale on things, but to stay refreshed and be obedient to God in our marriages, to honor our wives as the weaker vessel and taking care, great care for their needs. And loving them as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.